Hey, good morning, everybody. So glad you could join me. I'm Pastor Craig, and we are in the book of Mark. Uh, we're continuing on, so if you want to grab your Bibles right now and open up to Mark chapter 3, that's where we're going to put the bulk of our energy today. Uh, but let's just start with a question, kind of get you thinking, have you ever been confused about Jesus? Have you ever been confused about him? Like, who is he? Or maybe you know somebody right now that is struggling to understand who Jesus really is. Have you ever been in that place? This is not a new problem. In fact, the idea of who is Jesus has been going on since he came to earth. And even the disciples, as we're finding out, we're trying to figure out just who Jesus is. And just to kind of bring it to the relevance, if you were to do a quick study and, and look across the spectrum of other beliefs out there, many people deal with Jesus differently. So here's some examples. Um, the Jehovah Witness claim that Jesus is the, uh, the Michael the archangel, that he's a created angel, basically. And then if you go to the Mormon faith, they believe he's the spirit child or the brother of Satan. If you look at the Christian science, they say he's the offspring of Mary's self-conscious. Not sure how that works. The New Age say that he's a man, but he reached Christ-likeness or Christ-consciousness. If you study Islam, you would, you would deem him to be a prophet. If you studied Hindu, you would say he was an enlightened guru. If you studied Buddhism, you'd find out he's an enlightened master. Some call him a good teacher, but the fact is all of these cannot be the same truth. They can't all be the same. In fact, if you walked through these, you would find immediately there's a conflict about how you're supposed to see Jesus and what you're supposed to believe about him. And that brings us into our text today. If, if he cannot be all of these things, then the question we have to wrestle with, and then who really is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And we left off last week where Jesus was performing miracles. He was showing his power. He was showing his authority. And the scribes and other leaders watched as he was uh, at a, at the, um, on the Sabbath, he healed a, a hand of this man. It was a crippled hand. There was something withered about it. And in this moment, he looked to these scribes and these Pharisees, these, these wise teachers, and he was grieved by their hardness of heart. See, despite what he was performing, despite what he was doing, they were not convinced on who Jesus truly was. And this is the challenge that we face today going forward. But where they left off was they plotted to destroy him. So determined to prove that he's not who he said that they thought maybe the best approach would be to end his life, to get rid of Jesus. And so I want to go through the story. I'm going to read a lot of the text today. We're actually going to read most of chapter 3. So if you have your Bible in front of you or your YouVersion app or some way in which you can follow along, I'm reading from the ESV, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, I'm not going to pause as much as I do sometimes. Just We're just going to read through it together and get the context of the story. But there is one piece. We're going to dive in for just a moment. But we'll finish the fullness of that. So I'm not going to put it on the screens today. Um, if you're at the campus, it's inside your program. You can follow it there as well. Well, let's follow in now as Jesus first, uh, he just walked out of basically the synagogue. We don't know exactly how much time was in there, but just healed this withered man's hand. The Pharisees set out to destroy him, and we're back walking with the disciples. So let's walk with the disciples as they look at and we look at just who Jesus is. So verse 7, chapter 3. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from Tyre and Sidon. And when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because the crowd, lest they crush him, for he had healed many so that all who had disease pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. 
So Jesus is on his way. He has these crowds that keep pushing in. And I imagine you, if you had a disease today or you knew somebody that the opportunity to find healing, you would go to great lengths. And I think we see that happening as crowds are pressing in against Jesus. Verse 13, though, it says, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed 12, who he also named apostles. And that means sent ones. So he's, he's grabbing now the men of this, this group, many that are, that are following him, but he's calling specifically these 12, and he's going to name them the apostles, the, the sent ones. And he did that so that they might be with him, and then he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, that is, the sons of thunder. That's like a bike gang, the sons of thunder. It's a cool name that he gives them. These guys were, they were mighty. They, they weren't afraid to go and uh, maybe even pray to bring thunder and rain and fire down on people. And then verse 18, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew. And Matthew, we learned last time, Matthew was Levi, the tax collector. So this is now what you'll, he'll be known by as Matthew. And Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And if we just pause just for a moment, Jesus is beginning to take not just the ministry that he's come to do, but to begin to equip disciples, or in this case, apostles, to be sent out, to begin to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near and to work through them to do these miracles of casting out demons. It's an incredible time also because in the culture, this would have been appropriate for him to grab you know, men. That was part of the culture of the day. So he does grab 12 men, but we're going to find later on there's men and women are now going to be involved in the ministry of declaring the gospel of God is here, that heaven is near. And so as he grabs these 12, as he appoints them, as he directs them, you can imagine others, I'm sure, were watching. Some were wondering, why didn't he pick me? What, what, why wasn't I good enough? And we see uh, how people respond moving forward. Verse 20 says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down for Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and the prince of demons, he casts out demons. And he, Jesus, called them to him and said to them in parables. And we're beginning now to see Jesus is going to speak in parables. And next week, we're really going to press into just a a, a very... uh, misunderstood and complex parable. But the challenge of parables is he's speaking to people at the moment in the culture, but there are, there are implications that carry to us today. So Jesus speaks in parables, and here's what he says. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder the house or his house. Verse 28, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. 
So we get the context of Jesus, and I want to go through this a little bit and kind of pull out some, some key concepts. And I want to start with looking at the responses of three different groups of people. Um, but let's lay the foundation of that, that first we see that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. This is declared in the text yet again. This is a continual theme and a reminder if you're just kind of joining us or you're unfamiliar with this. This is a statement about his sonship. The sonship of Jesus is denoted as equal to God or translated more appropriately, it would be um, Jesus is God, the Son, God, the Son. This is God in the flesh. This is his nature, this is who he is. And so as we look at the text, I want you to look at the first response we see regarding Jesus. Verse 9 said, And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him, for he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the Son of God. They cried out, you are the Son of God. Look at the response. These are the demons, the unclean spirits. And what is their response? They fall down before him and they declare that you are the Son of God. Think about this. These are the demons who are opposed to Jesus. They are the enemy. They are against everything that Jesus is doing. We've seen how Jesus has authority to cast out demons, to silence them. They often make references to, have you come to destroy us? And what is their response? Uh, Heather Jones kind of, she laid it out this way. She had heard <coughs> the the demons, they have only one response. See, they can't lie about Jesus because there's no sin in him. They can't lie about him. In fact, all they can do is accuse him of truth. You are the son of God. And that's all they can utter. They can only proclaim the truth of who he is because they have nothing against him. And so for one, they accuse him to be the son of God or God in the flesh. And secondly, they fall down before him in, a, in an act almost of submission, and certainly the posture of it, that just like you and me, every knee will bow before Jesus. And this is the moment where we see the demons responding appropriately, even though they're in opposition to Jesus. Remember, he has all authority over them all authority. So we see now the, the demons, those who are directly opposed, the losing team, so to speak. They're against Jesus with everything they have, and yet their response is proper. They fall before him and declare, you are the son of God. But what about the family? Look at what the family does. In fact, I think it's interesting. I'm going to read it for a moment here. If you want to go back to, to your Bibles there, but it's in verse 20. Um, after Jesus grabbed the disciples, uh, or, you know, <laughs> named the 12, he got them and it says, verse 20, then they went home and the crowd gathered around again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he's out of his mind. So what's the family's response? This is a confusing part of this text. There's a lot of questions. Is Mary there? It seems like it, because later on you're going to see his mother's there. Is Mary questioning who Jesus is? That's, that's some of the, the, what the scholars are wrestling with. Is she questioning that he truly is the Son of God? But think about it from this perspective. Excuse my cough today. Their response is not to go fall down before him. Their response is not to declare, wow, Jesus, you truly are the son of God. Their response is to seize him and declare that he's out of his mind. Why would they declare he's out of his mind? I had some ideas and, and other scholars have this idea, but one, maybe people are upset because of the 12 he chose. Like you didn't choose your immediate family. You chose these tax collectors and sinners to be the ones you send out. This doesn't line up, Jesus. It doesn't make sense. So maybe they're thinking, he's out of his mind. He's not picking the right people. Or maybe he's, they're thinking, look at that guy. Remember Peter? Remember Matthew, the 
was Levi the tax collector? You're giving them authority to cast out demons? You're out of your mind. You're crazy. These guys don't know what they're doing. They're not going to ex- extend the kingdom of God. They're going to crush it down. Maybe that's one of the, the ways they see it. Maybe they think he's literally crazy. Look at the riots that are happening. People are pushing against him. He can't even go anywhere anymore. In fact, we're really uncomfortable with the aggressiveness of the crowd that's starting to form. He's out of his mind. Who does he think he is? What does he think? He's the Messiah? He's out of his mind. Or maybe they just thought straight up, he's just not healthy. Something is wrong. Some wiring snapped somewhere along the way. He's, he's not healthy. He's, he's out of his mind. The way he's behaving seems reckless, perhaps. The way he's behaving maybe seems just too far out there. It was nice when it was just a few of us and we were having great discussions about God. But now he's got people with diseases and demons and they're pushing and they're pressing and they're going after him. I think he's maybe just snapped. But notice their response was not to fall before him and not to declare that he truly is the Son of God. The third group we see then are the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, it says they came down from Jerusalem. They came down from Jerusalem. This is about 80 plus miles away, walking, riding camels, whatever they rode, however they got there. They didn't just, you know, jump in a car and cruise over there. They had to uh, traverse the deserts. And they came out of their way, it says, from Jerusalem saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. They are declaring at that moment, he is basically Satan. Let that sink in. These these guys are the ones who are supposed to know who the Messiah would be. They had all the signs. And their response was not to fall down and worship, not to declare the Son of God. It was to accuse him of being Satan. He's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. Isn't that ironic? The demons themselves acknowledge Jesus. The family want to seize him. And the scribes and the Pharisees want to accuse him of actually being demonically possessed or Satan himself. So how do you respond to Jesus? How do you respond to Jesus? Are you in a place today where you're still wrestling with, can this really be God? We opened up the book of Mark with a clear statement of Jesus' desire that people would repent and believe, to admit that we do not have authority, that Jesus has all authority. So how do you deal with Jesus? How do you respond to Jesus? Do you doubt his love is genuine? Do you question whether his forgiveness is truly 100% forgiveness, that he really has the authority and the power to forgive sins? How do you respond when Jesus is declared to be God in the flesh? How does that sit with you? How's that wrestling match? And if you've declared that, how confident are you that as others challenge that, that you have full assurance that this is, in fact, who Jesus is? One of the beautiful things of the gospel is that when we put our faith in Jesus, God in the flesh, The word says that we, through Ephesians, that we can come before him with freedom and confidence. Although we will, I believe, (laughs) bow before him just because of his majesty, we don't have to fear anymore like the demons do. It's good news. It means that, that this is God in the flesh who went to great lengths for you and me so that you and I could be in a relationship with God where we don't have to fear and tremble. We don't have to cower before him. But our appropriate response would be to kneel before him and to declare that he is, in fact, the Son of God. So we've got demons who are pretty clear. They know who Jesus is. In fact, he created them, it said, if you remember the teaching a few weeks ago. We have 
the family who wants to seize him. We have the scribes who want to accuse him. And then Jesus takes a little sidestep. He says, looking down at these Pharisees, looking to them, he speaks to them in a parable. And and let's look at that parable real quick. He says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. As Jesus faces the accusations that he's possessed, as he faces them, what he does is he begins to speak directly to the problem. And he says, look, the strong man in this scenario is Satan himself, but the stronger one has come. See, the the scribes and the Pharisees, they were expecting the Messiah to come, and they were expecting the Messiah to come and to rule and to reign and to subdue the earth, to put an end to all of the evil. But Jesus is going to do something here that is not in the plan that they had. He says, I'm here to bind the strong man. I am the stronger one. And by doing so, I will redeem my prized possessions. That's you and me. I've come down to redeem my possession, to go and extract you from the grip that the enemy has on you. I'm going to go to great lengths and even give up my life just for you. But this doesn't make sense to the scribes. In fact, what I want you to see is that Jesus has Holy Spirit power. Jesus has Holy Spirit power. Let's go back to the scribes for a minute. Remember, the scribes are the ones who hold the scrolls, the ancient text. They've been studying and they have all the the knowledge, memorized many of them, of the first five books of the Bible. And as they would have read that and grown up and studied, they would be reminded continually of the Messiah who would come, the Messiah who would come through a virgin birth to a specific location. He would perform miracles of healings and demon possessions. He would declare that he could forgive sins, that he would be baptized. And as as we saw that in the beginning of this book of Mark, that the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. He was then ushered out, led by the Spirit, into a, a season of temptation where he defeated Satan through never being tempted to the point of sin, where he uttered the truths about who God is and who he is. And Jesus then continued, powered by the Holy Spirit, through his teaching, through his authority, through his healings, through the ability to cast out demons. And then he addresses the scribes. Look what he says to them. He says, truly, truly. This is a, this is a word that emphatically says, there's truth here that you need to hear. <laughs> It's it's an emphatic reply. Listen closely. This is dire information. Truly, I, I, (laughs) all sins will be forgiven. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven. Sorry, there's a typo on my slide there. Let me read that again. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. They are declaring before him he does not have the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit power. They are declaring he has satanic power, demonic power. And so this is the the temptation of this passage, and I've seen this done many times, is the confusion of the passage is to say, if you say anything against the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. Or others have said, if you are saved and you say something against the Holy Spirit, you will lose your salvation. This is one of the challenges of reading when you look at Jesus' interaction with people before the cross, but also realizing what it means to be in a covenant of grace. In this particular case, looking directly at the scribes, looking directly at the Pharisees, Jesus is declaring, you are rejecting God and attributing God to be Satan. 
Because of your rejection, there is no salvation for you. No forgiveness of sins, period. You cannot be forgiven of sins if you're going to attribute who I am as being Satan. You can't. There's no forgiveness of sins. But remember what God's grace says for you and me. There is still truth in the statement. I want to make this really clear. There's still truth in this statement. If you choose to reject who Jesus is, it says that is the only eternal sin. To reject the truth of Jesus is to close the door on the potential for forgiveness. Now, praise God, that doesn't mean there's not hope in the journey of your life to repent and believe as Jesus calls us to. But if you refuse to repent and believe, what is left for you is no forgiveness. But by God's grace, for those of you who have repented and believed in Jesus, if we have a bad day and we maybe utter some things we're not proud of, or we may even question God or get angry at God, it's by his grace that he walks us to glory someday. It's by his grace. It's by his mercy. See, the the beauty of the gospel says that you start today with life that is abundant in Christ. And then he walks you through the process of sanctification, making you more in his image as you surrender more fully to him until the day you reach that glorious day where you receive the inheritance to be in the kingdom of God forever in his full presence. But for these people in this time, they were rejecting Jesus. And I hope that you're not rejecting Jesus. I hope that you're taking this conversation seriously and evaluating who is he and what am I doing with this truth? I want to close with one last point today, that Jesus invites us to a new family. See, the truth of the gospel is this, that for those who refuse to believe, for those who refuse to believe, then they do not have forgiveness. But for those who choose to repent and believe, there is a full forgiveness of sins, and there's something greater. This passage is really unique because here we have Jesus, remember, he's got a lot of people around him. They're gathered around. His mother and his brothers are outside, and the crowd says, hey, your mother and your brother are out there. And Jesus, of course, says, the, asks the question, who are my mother and my brothers? Who are they? And looking around, so sitting around him are men and women following, desiring to be disciples, listening to his teaching. Looking around, he says, for here is my mother and my brothers. And whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. This is beautiful gospel hope. Jesus looks around the men and women and says, Yes, they are my earthly family, but I'm here to usher in a kingdom family. Remember I said, repent and believe. The kingdom of God is near. This is your chance. This is the opportunity before you that you can enter into my family. It doesn't matter about your financial standing, what jobs you have or how big your savings account is or how small it might be or non-existent. The limitations you might have, They don't keep you from this opportunity to be in the family of God. The the culture you've come out of or the language you speak, the clothes you wear, the people you hang out with, what you've done in your past or who you think you might be in the future, none of that will withhold you from an opportunity to repent and believe and be part of this family. One family, one future, one hope. Jesus looks around and Today, he looks around with you and me, and he says, whoever does the will of my father, you can be my brother, my sister, my mother. You can be part of this family. And people often ask, so what is God's will? And Jesus has already declared that. 
if you would repent and believe. That is God's will. Repent and believe. Believe that the one who came is who he said he is, Jesus, the Son of God. Believe that in him is life and life abundantly. Believe him that when he was on the cross and he said, it is finished, he really meant it. That a new covenant came where in faith in Jesus, forgiveness of sins, complete and final, is given. We're ushered into a family with a new inheritance, with a new family, a new title, a new citizenship is granted. And hope that the day is coming when Jesus will return and we will all be together as one family. As the demons declared Jesus, as the family wrestled with him and wanted to to take him in and demanded he was crazy, as the scribes declared he was possessed by Satan himself. How do you deal with Jesus? It's a simple invitation. Repent and believe. Love you guys. I'm going to release to the campuses. Talk to you soon. May God bless you. So how do you deal with Jesus? My question today for you what do you struggle to believe about Jesus? If you're watching this and where you're struggling is, can Jesus really be God? Can I encourage you to go back and read through the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Could you go back, spend time, an honest survey of what Jesus did to prove who he said he was? Remember, we're leading up. Ultimately, every gospel ends with Jesus on the cross being crucified because of his declaration of being God. So where do you struggle, or what do you struggle to believe about Jesus? Do you, maybe today you're struggling to believe that his provision is truly going to be enough. If I surrender to him, what about all the other things I want to do? What about finances? What about, what about my future? Maybe you're struggling with that. I want to encourage you to wrestle and take that before God and ask, God, help me understand your provision. Help me understand your forgiveness is complete. If you struggle to believe that Jesus can fully forgive you, I want to encourage you to spend time. So one of the things that we are not so good at, I believe, is being willing to spend time with Jesus, to ask the hard questions, because oftentimes the questions we're most asking are the ones we already have an answer to. Jesus, can you really fully forgive me? The answer is yes, but the question is, will you fully receive it? Let me pray for you guys today. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you that in Christ we have hope. Thank you that he made a way for us to have full relationship with God the Father, to be indwelt by God the Spirit, and to have a deep connection to God the Son. Thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. I pray if anyone listening today does not yet know you, they would do the simple act of repent and believe, to turn away from their life, to surrender it fully to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Look forward to seeing you next time.